it's so full of poison pills. Tell me. Okay, well, first of all, it's going to be everybody who does follow this. You have to, supposedly, if you have a gun, you have to have a homeowner's and renter's insurance policy. And, of course, it's completely bogus because, as I said, the insurance already covers it. But if insurance companies start saying, okay, we'll put on a gun rider on our policies, then insurance records can be accessed by the government. So now we have registration of all the gun owners. But there's more. So when it comes to gun issues, there's no one I trust more than Dave Kopel, Second Amendment scholar extraordinaire. But before that, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Click that little bell icon and get notified when we have new content. And find our podcast on your favorite platforms. All right, Mr. Kopel, have you ever seen such a big attack on the Second Amendment in Colorado's history? Never, not even close. Not even close, because I remember, was it 10 years ago, we had several gun-related issues, including magazine limit, a universal background check, and uh, gun show things. Worse than that. Well, uh, let's see what passes out of the legislature. But the, uh, the amount of, of hatred, really, uh, against gun owners uh, being expressed this session uh, far exceeds uh, anything else in, in Colorado political history. And I'm I have a pretty good memory of Colorado political history myself from the late 80s and actually derivatively from my father, who was a state legislator and uh, worked for the legislative drafting office before that, starting in the late 50s. And I, you know, I've written the Colorado constitutional law and history textbook, so I'm fairly familiar with everything going back to the, uh, the gold rush. Let's start off from a real basic point. I understand people are frustrated. People are scared. The King Supers where I shop was a site of a deadly mass shooting. Yes. And you, you know my history. I used to be a gun phobe. I hated guns. I gave money to the other side in a previous life until I started researching it and getting the emotion out. But I understand why people are so flipped out and they just want the guns to go. They want the unicorns to come and disarm everyone. What do you say to those people who are not literate in how guns work, but they still just want a safer Colorado. Well, just look at the war on drugs. You know, people were very upset about drugs, uh, some of them starting in the 60s. It, it got to a real peak in the, uh, the late 1980s. And they said, you know, drug misuse is, is very bad. You know, look at crack addicts, all those things. And that, that's definitely true. Uh, but when they turned on the, the heavy hand of maximal state repression on that, uh, it often made things worse, and, and among other things, made things more violent. Also worse for people who are minorities. And uh, I look at these laws being put forward, a syntax on guns and ammunition, meaning it's gonna be harder to train with guns, it's harder yeah. to practice with guns, um, extra training for uh, concealed carry, even though you have to get training now, all sorts of things that are going to make it much a liability mm. insurance bill. Mm. You know, so people who can't afford mm. their car insurance are supposed to get a liability insurance uh, to protect themselves. And these are people who are often in the inner city. It sure seems to me that the Jim Crow gun laws of you know 150 years ago are not that much different, that these gun laws really disproportionately hurt minorities uh, people of the black and brown communities. Am I wrong on this one? <laughs> no, you're right about the, the disproportionate thing. But I'd also say that another parallel with Jim Crow, by, by which sort of meaning the uh, legislative era from 1810 to about 1920 at its peak, and then it's still continued on with, with legally mandated segregation for many, many decades after that, the Southern state legislatures after the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment was enacted, no state shall deny any person the equal protection of the laws, they couldn't write gun laws that were racially specific anymore, which they had done all the time 
uh, in both before and after the, the Civil War. S- stop there for a second. The first gun laws were, were, <coughs> were directed at African Americans, weren't they? I mean, well, you, you can go back all the way to, to 1619, the, when the Virginia legislature uh, says that uh, uh, blacks can't have guns. All right. So there's a lot of racism in gun laws. So bring it, bring it to um, a more recent times. That with the Fourteenth Amendment says everybody's covered by the law. Yeah, even even people who are African American. Right, and so the legislatures have to stop writing gun laws that say that are defined on the basis of the person's color. So they instead focus on laws that they know will um, most effectively disarm poor people by pricing gun ownership out of reach. These laws are not aimed, or at least their effect, is not entirely on, just on black people. And black people, you know, most of them had been slaves until recently, they they tended to be poor. Uh, But there were also plenty of poor whites. And the legislatures of the South also uh, apparently didn't mind uh, taking guns or preventing gun acquisition by poor whites. How would they do it back then? I mean, it's very obvious now if you're going to have syntaxes on guns, liability insurance, extra training in order to uh, exercise your constitutional right, this is going to affect poor people a whole lot more than upper income people. How did they do it back then if they couldn't say, we don't want guns in the hands of people of color? Well, what some state legislatures did is they had personal property taxes, which in general are, are lawful. You know, we're, we're used to paying ownership taxes on real estate that we own, and likewise on automobiles. Right. But more common back then was also personal property taxes on, you know, your whole household. You own $200 worth of furniture, you got to pay a tax on that and on all the rest of your personal property. And so besides making, say, handguns and uh, good quality knives like Bowie knives, subject to <clears throat> the ordinary personal property tax rates, they jacked it up higher and put special punitively high personal property taxes on handguns, sometimes on handgun ammunitions, and on knives they didn't like, you know, Bowie knives. So and basically, others. isn't the Colorado legislature basically doing the same thing now? I find it so odd that progressive Democrats are the ones pushing these laws that disproportionately hurt people of color. <laughs> your, your error is thinking that progressive Democrats, of, as they identify today, are just an extension of what liberal Democrats used to be, which were the kind of Democrats that I grew up with, like my dad, Jerry, uh, who served in the legislature for 22 years. And he was one of the most liberal in the legislature, but there were most Democrats in the legislature in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and even uh, at the start of this century uh, were were liberal overall. Liberal people are open-minded, tolerant, very into freedom of speech. They weren't, liberal Democrats were not, you know, absolutely opposed to gun control. But what they were very concerned about was fairness. And they knew how laws that, you know, a lawyer or a person who can afford a lawyer can comply with may not work so well for somebody who, you know, right. so r- some, runs out. Somebody of, who hasn't yeah. had, uh, had, can't afford the lawyers, <laughs> can't afford um, uh the representation, afford to go through the legal hoops. And there was a time when liberals looked out for people who were poor. Right. Now, you can contrast that with the insurance bill, which I think is the... Uh, let, let, let's go through the matter at a time. <clears throat> this is a good one. Let's start off with this insurance bill. What, well, what it does is it says, in order for me to keep my guns or have guns, I also have to have liability insurance for when I hurt somebody with guns? For, for a gun accident. <clears throat> you, the, this bill is better than some that were proposed, you know, talked about in other states, because you you can't insure against an intentional act. You know, you you, you can't <laughs> buy 
insurance and say on your automobile, well, what if I ram my automobile through the plate glass window of a bank so I can rob it? Can I get it by an insurance policy that'll cover it so that'll help the bank repair its window? And the insurance company will say, no, you can't insure against your own intentional misconduct. And that suicide would also be part of that. You, you can't- the same, same way you can't buy a policy and offer yourself the next week. At, at least- Two years. Yeah, maybe a life insurance policy might cover that, but not not an act, not a uh, <clears throat> not a homeowner's right. policy. So, currently, any homeowner's policy you buy will implicitly insure against well, well explicitly will insure against accidental injuries to people on your property. They're walking up your driveway. You didn't shovel it. They slip on the ice, they get injured, they can sue because of the accident that was related to your property. Same thing for your chainsaw. You know, you're using the chainsaw in the front yard to cut wood, the chainsaw slips and, you know, in, injures somebody else. Uh, even though you don't have chainsaw insurance explicitly, but you, you have do. to be able to own a house in order to get that. <clears throat> And not everybody can afford renter's insurance or even has renter's insurance. So am I wrong to say that this insurance mandate is for people who, who can afford a house, can afford extra insurance, and it's just another way to say, poor people, we don't want you to have guns. Well, yes, and, and so here's an example of that. You have your gun insurance already automatically by, if you have homeowner's insurance, and likewise, if you have renter's insurance. But there are people, apparently unbeknownst to Representative Woodrow uh, of Aurora and the others who introduced this bill, there are other people who are neither owners of homes nor renters of their homes. You know, you've, if, if you had trouble and, you know, in, in your life and you had to come live with me in my basement, Again. Uh, again, right. And you couldn't buy renter's insurance. You'd be, you'd be just living in my house. I've right. got the homeowner's insurance, but you, uh, you're not the homeowner and you're not the lessor of any property. You're, you're nothing. And so you can't buy homeowner's or renter's insurance. You know, and some other guy who's like, you know, living with a friend because that's all he can afford. Maybe the friend has rental and renter's insurance, but does that the, cover the other me? guy doesn't. Well, the insurance actually might might cover you. So the problem, <clears throat> so yes, if, if you come to my my house and you, you, you stay there and you accidentally cause a gun accident that injures somebody else, yes, that would probably, that would be covered by my homeowner's insurance policy. But that's not what the law says. The law says you have to have your own policy, which would be a homeowner's policy or a renter's policy. And if you're not a homeowner or a home renter, then there's nothing for you, you to become, buy. If you become homeless and you're living in your car, if you become homeless and you're living on the street with your family or you're living someplace else, there you have. Is, and, and so the, now you're illegal. Right. Now you can't own a gun because you, you can't get a renter's insurance policy because you're not a renter, and so it's against the law for you to possess a firearm. I want to talk about the tax bill. No, I want to, no, I want to right. talk more about this insurance bill. All right, go ahead. Because it's, it's so full of poison pills. Tell me. Okay, well, first of all, it's going to be everybody who does follow this. You have, you're supposedly, if you have a gun, you have to have a homeowner's or renter's insurance policy and of course, it's completely bogus because, as I said, the insurance already covers it. But if insurance companies start saying, OK, we'll put on a gun rider on our policies, then insurance records can be accessed by the government. So now we have registration of all the gun owners. But there's more. But there's more. Under the bill, any law enforcement officer, any time can ask anyone for proof of their insurance policy. So I'm driving down the street 
they pull me over because they're, I'm being profiled, and they can say, where's your, where's your insurance policy for the gun you have? Right. You can, of course, you have to have the insurance policy for the car because you're, you're driving the car. the car and you keep it with you. And maybe you're, you're right. You're, maybe you're lawfully carrying a gun in your car. Where's your insurance policy for the car? Who carries their homeowner's insurance policy around with them? And suppose me, as a lawyer, I, I did and say, okay, I'm going for a drive. I'll take a photocopy of my homeowner's <laughs> insurance policy with me. And then the police officer looks at it and he says, hmm, you know, fire, flood, tornado, accidents in general. I don't see anything here that says something specific about guns, which is true because the insurance policies cover all accidents involving you know, guns, ice, Drano, chainsaws, right. everything else. You have an accident on your property, that's covered, but it doesn't specifically say chainsaws or firearms. So here's the officer who's, you know, not an insurance lawyer. He says, mm, the driver doesn't say, it. he handed me his homeowner's insurance policy. I read all 11 pages, didn't see the word firearm. So now I'm going to write him up uh, for the fine he'll have to pay for not having insurance. And then maybe I'll go to court and win. But again, that's, that's part of the discrimination. You know, some people with flex time jobs and high levels of education can go to court and represent themselves and, and maybe come out fine. But a lot of people, they don't have a job where they can get a day off from work to do some court appearance. They don't understand the legal process and they don't have $1,000 uh, just sitting around under the, you know, in a coffee can uh, so they can pay for a lawyer to defend themselves from these bogus charges. And it's not just in the car. You're, you're walking down the street. Officer can come up to you and say, do you have a gun insurance policy? Maybe I'm not concealed carrying at that moment, but if I own a gun, I have to, under this law, give my homeowner's insurance policy to the officer right then and there. So this is an incredibly sleazy trick in the bill to basically make everyone subject to the police going, show us your papers. Because the bill doesn't say the officer has to know that the individual has, this is, has a this gun. This is another thing that a police officer can use for profiling or for adding charges to somebody. You know, again, what I find so remarkable about all this that the same progressives who are trying to defund the police are now trying to empower the police to target minorities with many of these laws. And, and for time, I, we need to keep rolling on, on, on but some But I just want to make one point. Yeah. The difference between people who wrongly self-identify as progressive versus classical Colorado liberal Democrats is you would have had plenty of liberal Democrats in you know, say 1978 or 94, said, oh, let's have a statewide gun registration. And they might have voted for a bill that did that. But to put something in the insurance code that is designed to maximize harassment of poor people and do all these sleazy things via the insurance code, they never would have stood for that because they thought their job was to protect the consumers and not to find ways to manipulate the insurance code and similar things uh, against the most vulnerable people in society. It is, it is a bureaucratic, trickster way to eat away at, at a law you don't want to take on uh, full value. Speaking on, on registration, why is it that we don't like registration? Those of us who are gun owners, let me tell you, back when I was a gun phobe, the idea of gun registration made perfect sense. We register our cars. You know, we register all sorts of things. Shouldn't the government know where all the guns are? Why don't we register abortions and birth control? If you don't have something to hide, what's the problem? Because those are medical procedures. We have HIPAA for that. That's between me and my doctor. Exactly. It's a matter but of my privacy. Abortion, my abortion is not going <clears> to <throat> kill somebody else. My abortion <laughs> is, is... Only one only at a one. time. All right. It's not going to kill anybody else but that fetus. Um, it's not like my abortion is going to be stolen by somebody and used in a crime. It's not like my abortion is going to go do a mass murder, except that that one unborn life. You know, we, you know, how can you compare abortion and just regular registration? Because the purpose of registration 
is confiscation. That's what's happened in almost every country with gun registration. You, United Kingdom and England most prominently. These are the things that President Obama, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said repeatedly, we should copy the good gun laws they have in Australia and, and the New United Zealand. Kingdom, and w which is you first you register them and then you confiscate them. Not every single gun, but you confiscate whatever guns, whatever types the government wants to confiscate. So that's the purpose of registration. It doesn't solve crimes because it would solve a crime if somebody, say, had their registered handgun and then they used their registered handgun uh, to go to the bank and they robbed the bank. And then on the way out, they had so many bags of money that they accidentally dropped the handgun. And then the police find the handgun, look up who owns the handgun, go there and find the, the robber counting his loot. But gun crimes are overwhelmingly perpetrated with guns that were not lawfully possessed in the first Every place. Every time I see one of these gun laws coming up, a, a political cartoon pops in my mind or an animated yeah. cartoon. Bad guy in the middle is a legislature, good guy. And the legislature looks at the bad guy and says, you got to stop doing this. Otherwise, we're going to do something bad. Like what? And he goes over and he beats the nice gun owner. Yeah. The guy who hasn't done a damn thing, has followed every law, and then turns back to the bad guy and says, now have you learned your lesson? Yeah. No? Well, we'll give you some more. We'll beat up the innocent guy. <laughs> and as an innocent guy, I am tired of losing my gun rights for crimes I've never committed, nor will I ever commit. But you are deserving of symbolic punishment in the view of the regressives uh, who dominate the Democratic caucus in the legislature these days. You know, back to my dad's time in the legislature. Were they suspicious of handguns? Yes. And at the same time, they'd turn around and genuflect and say, we got nothing against rifles and shotguns. You know, those, those are perfectly nice things that people use for hunting and target shooting. The new culture of the gun control, gun ban movement, is different. It is against gun ownership per se. Ms. Gabrielle Giffords, head of the largest anti-gun organization, did a Time Magazine did a big cover story lauding her uh, last spring. And they asked her what she thought. And she said, no more guns, gone. And the, the staffer who was with her was trying to stop her. And Ms. Giffords was insisting. She told the truth. She forthrightly told the truth. So the fact that you own any Beto gun- work. Hell you, yes, we're coming for your guns. You, the fact that you're a gun owner makes you an inherently bad person in their view. So, you know, collateral damage, you know, it's like, oh, we, we may not, uh, you know, uh, you're bad in self. So any, any punishment, anything that makes your life worse and it is a benefit to be in itself. That liberals believe these ridiculous ideas like you're innocent until proven guilty. Uh, now you're just guilty until you're proven innocent. We're going to take your gun away. All right, for time's sake, let's, let's, I, I want to rifle a few uh, through these. Get that? Rifle? A few. Pretty good Riff, riffle, I think, is how some people pronounce it. Well, I anyway. wouldn't do it. Okay. When I go and I buy a gun and I use a credit card, and I go to Dick's Sporting Good or someplace, yeah. and I buy a gun, uh, a new bill would say there has to be a special category right. for me. Why? <laughs> so they can confiscate your guns. So, so it's another way to... So that they're... They because, can register guns. So they, could, they can make banks, who are the credit card issuers, report transactions at firearms-related merchants. Now, at the moment, you go to Dick's Sporting Goods. Well, actually, Dick's, I think, stopped selling guns. Um, but, you know, go to Cabela's, okay. you know, where you can buy a boat for $35,000. Or all kinds of things, you know, uh, clothing, outdoor gear, fishing stuff. You know, it's a it's a great superstore. But among the things they sell are are firearms. So we start off with all your transactions at Cabela's. The banks having to separate them out as separate merchant category codes, and then the regulators 
can say, oh, you better start reporting to us uh, suspicious transactions. So right now I go to Cabela's, I buy a bunch of stuff and some ammunition. It all goes under the same code to the, insur- to the um, uh, credit card company. Now Cabela's is going to have to act like the cop and go, well, there's a code for that. Now we have to have another code for this, which means the not, bank companies. Not, not quite yet. You're, yeah. You go to Cabela's, it's general merchandise. Right. Is how it's coded now. You know, the, the same as if you go to Target. But if they're sort of pass. The, the, the bill would say every Cabela's transaction, because Cabela's oh. sells firearms, among <laughs> other things. That's what looks <laughs> suspicious. And then down the line, they want to say, you actually have to separate the transactions. Like, you know, here's your thermal socks. Good, you got to buy that with one credit card transaction. And then, and then here's the ammunition. We got to make a separate transaction. Again, another great way to profile people. And with AI and all the incredible uh, computing power we have, it will be easier and easier to find the people who have guns. Let's keep going with these yeah. just for time's sake. Um, safe places. Now, Colorado has a shall issue uh, carry permit, and we can take our guns where we're danger, where it's dangerous. I find it fascinating and, and just desperately sad that in the places where we've had mass shootings are now the places we can't carry guns. Um, Boulder, for instance, houses, houses of worship. Well, that's where there's been mass shootings. Stores, well, that's where there's been mass shootings. Theaters, well, that's where there's been mass shootings. As if to say, all the places that you are most danger, we're going to keep you the least defended. Uh, what does the safe storage bill do? And I know as we're talking well, about so, it, it's going through yeah. the process. Yeah, so the, the sensitive places bill, it's, it's been considerably approved to get out of uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee, although we'll, we'll see what happens with it. But as, as the bill was introduced, you're right, it creates safe zones for mass shooters. And that's what they want. They would rather, by they, I mean the gun ban lobby, and I mean Michael Bloomberg in particular, uh, the, the sugar daddy of the every town uh, organization. There was a, in Texas a couple of years ago, some guy walked into a church and started shooting at people. And one of the people in the church pulled out his own lawfully licensed carry handgun and shot the attacker and stopped the mass shooting and saved many, many lives. And Michael Bloomberg's reaction, what he said, that wasn't his job. He wasn't supposed to do that. So in the Bloomberg view, you should wait. You know, call 911, let the shooting continue for several minutes until the police show up. And then they can shoot the attacker. But the idea of an ordinary citizen shooting the attacker, Bloomberg doesn't want that. So no wonder that lobby produces bills to create safe zones for mass shooters and for criminals in general. To say that if, you know, if a woman goes jogging in a municipal park at six o'clock in the morning and she has a, and she's been licensed, she's been fingerprinted, she's been trained, she can't carry a gun for her protection because the gun ban lobby, they're against gun ownership in general, but what they hate the most is lawful self-defense. In their view, that's disorderly. Why do you think they hate lawful self-defense? Because they believe in a top-down hierarchical society of which Europe is their dream, where elites run the world for, for the little people and make better decisions for the little people and the little people can make themselves. How do you square that with with Black Lives Matter. Let me go a little further with this. I think about what these laws in 2024 are gonna be like 25, 50, 100 years from now. And what we're doing is we are stratifying society. Cops can have AR-15s, you cannot. Cops can carry guns in uh, unsafe places, you cannot. Um, one of the great things about American law enforcement is that American law enforcement are us. These, these are not a different group. These are not thugs. These are not um, people who just work for the elite. They're the guys we see at our neighborhood barbecues, and they are us. They're not soldiers. They're not there with tanks. They're us. But 
as we're pushing these laws, we are dividing this society into people who can have guns, even after they retire, and those who have to be defenseless. I worry what's gonna happen in decades to come when this happens. And what gets me is that the people who scream Black Lives Matter, who don't trust the cops, are the ones who want to make sure that there's this different system of government agents having guns, government citizens not having those same guns. That's what scares me to death. Well, and scares lots of law enforcement officers as well, which is why in my recent briefs in the U.S. Supreme Court and in, in other courts, including U.S. District Court in Colorado, I've been representing sheriff's offices, sheriff's offices uh, as well as the uh, International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association, the National Sheriff's Association. We could go on and on. And these law-abiding law enforcement organizations, they believe that exactly the kinds of guns that their officers and deputies carry, which is only for the purpose of lawful defense of self and others, they carry them because they're the best guns for lawful defense of self and others. And that's exactly why law-abiding citizens should be able to carry the same ones. They don't believe in that separation of law enforcement society. Oh, some from of the society. police chiefs do. Some of the police chiefs do, but they're political appointees. Sheriffs are elected, and the vast majority of rank and file law enforcement uh, are on the side because of the law Because they understand that the cop is carrying that gun with 17 round magazine because that's the best choice for his defense and for him to defend others. He's got an AR in the trunk of his car because he knows that that's the best gun for self-defense. And, and soon we won't have those. And, and it's, just, let, me, let me just say yeah. it again, for people who don't get it. For people who don't get it. The idea that progressives who hate the cops and think black lives matter, which they do, are building a system to make sure that black lives are completely unarmed, completely defenseless, and the cops are the ones that are going to have all the, the best defense weapons over time, this is going to make that a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Well, look, look at, at, you know, uh, Representative Epps and Representative Hernandez and their assault weapon bill. Mm -hmm. And they come in the legislature with these, and the bill they wrote, you know, these horrific libels against gun owners claiming that what they call so-called assault weapons have no purpose other, other than, than mass kill. killing. You know, they're not good for self-defense. They're not good for hunting. They're good for nothing except aggressive mass murder. So they claim. And then the bill they introduce says, okay, we're not going to sell any more of those except to law enforcement <laughs> officers. <laughs> Who can the, do mass killing. Yeah, so so-called abolitionists. What, but that shows you the, the big long-term picture of them and of not people who say the slogan Black Lives Matter, but the organization itself, the New Global Black Lives Matter Foundation, whose leaders have bragged that they're trained Marxists, admirers of Mao and Lenin and the rest. And so it's only abolish the police means, or defund the police, these police, these police who are our friends and neighbors and help protect us. If you want a Marxist society, then you want a military dictatorship because that's what every Marxist society is. And then the government's people have the guns and nobody else does. Let's talk about so-called assault weapons. This is comical if it wasn't so very dangerous. It's the um, pornography description. I know it's assault weapon when I see one, I just can't describe it. And so I look at the what makes an assault weapon an assault weapon. It's just a rifle. It's just a regular semi-automatic gun, but it's the pistol grip. Remember, guns don't kill people. Pistol grips kill people. Or a um, um, uh, something to diffuse the flash afterwards, which keeps your barrel down, which makes it easier. What is that, a flash guard? Flash uh, suppressor. Flash suppressor. Um, uh, which, which lots of guns have to help you shoot better. A folding stock. A folding stock makes a gun more portable and easier to use and more adjustable for a person 
depending on his or her size. So the same couple could use the same gun. Right, a, a telescope, that would be a, a telescoping telescope. stock. Right. Yeah. You know, the, the, these are all cosmetic features that help people shoot more accurately. Yes. Why are they, in, why are they dangerous? So, like you say, the assault weapon ban in this legislative session, like every previous one that's been introduced going back to the 1989, not one of them banned guns based on how fast they fire. Not one of them banned guns on how powerful their ammunition is. It's all based on things like you said, which is like a telescoping stock. So you can, instead of having one piece of wood, that's fine if you happen to be of exactly average height, you can adjust the stock for a better fit if you're taller or shorter. A better fitting stock helps you hold the gun against your shoulder more securely so that you can fire it more accurately, which is more safely. But in the view of the anti, of the gun ban lobbies, that's bad. They don't want guns to be accurate. In fact, the Epps-Hernandez assault weapon bill specifically complains that these guns allow ease of use, they say, by non-experts. They'd rather have people who aren't gun experts have guns that are hard to use. So in other words, that are more, they, they, that they are want the accurate. elderly person who's defending himself <laughs> at home to, to use a musket that is much more difficult to use and, and put his own powder in than a gun that has been designed so that he can be accurate and defend himself. But remember, self-defense is immoral. That's the government's job. You, you really shouldn't be that? doing that. You really think that's what be, what's behind this? Oh, uh, ultimately, yes. I mean, that that's the, we, the, I, the, the big cause of the gun ban movement uh, going back to its foundation as official organizations in the 70s was... At the time, they would say, oh, we got nothing against people having a gun for self-defense. And some of them, the more tolerant ones, might even say you can even have a handgun uh, to use at the target range. But as for defending yourself, no, that's, that's the government's job. You shouldn't be doing that. The older I get, the more I see racism in it. The more that I see that this is elites saying to poorer people, screw you. I can afford the gun. I can afford the tax. I can afford the trainings. I can afford the liability. I can afford uh, to go to the club and have uh, better rent guns that I want. I'm going to be fine. It's you poor people, you people of color. And I'm amazed that that isn't the crux of the arguments going on in the Capitol. Well, if, and if these people had prevailed in or their ancestors in southern states in, say, 1950, then the civil rights movement would have been impossible because in uh, Charles Cobb, who was a professor at Brown University and was you know, very involved as an activist in the South in the 60s, explained that at a time when the Ku Klux Klan and other domestic terrorist organizations were either tolerated by local law enforcement or actually heavily overlapped with local law enforcement, the reason the civil rights workers in the South could stay alive to do voter registration and things like that was because the Southern black community was very heavily armed and they could deter attacks by these criminals, these terrorist white supremacists. And you have many, many people from that era who have written about the fact that it was only the gun ownership that, you know, maybe as a white civil rights worker coming from Yale University, like my lawyer friend Don Cates did, um, he didn't go down as a gun guy, but he found himself protected by a bunch of black people in the community with guns. And he then went on to become a, a, a civil rights advocate on many fronts, including for the right to arms. And so if the progressives self-identified had their way Back in the olden days, we'd still have Jim Crow with us because the Klan officially, semi-officially tolerated violence and police violence against the civil rights workers would have triumphed and there would have been no way to to fight back. And in fact, that's that's what did happen 
um, in the uh, the South during Reconst uh, when Reconstruction ended, when there were black former slaves being poor, had a lot fewer firearms than the ones they did, got confiscated by the Klan the first time they came into the community. So these people saying, no guns for self-defense, you can only defend yourself with the government. We want, the, the government wants to know everybody who's got any gun. That's exactly the kind of thing that would have prevented the civil rights revolution in the first place. We haven't talked about the tax, the sin tax. Yeah. 11% um, sin tax on guns and ammunition. Yeah. Again, meaning that poor people <clears throat> can't buy a gun and they can't practice with a gun in order to be proficient. Um, where does the money go? Well, and if it's a tax, don't we get to vote on it? Um, we, we may get to vote on it, yes. I, I, think there, I think that's what the proposal is. It would actually go to a referendum. Um, since the 1930s, the federal government has put an 11% excise tax at the manufacturer to wholesale, wholesaler level uh, that is used to promote conservation, uh, the conservation of game species, and the, it's called the Pittman-Robertson Act. And now it goes for many, uh, it, it benefits conservation in general, not, not just game species. And it's also used uh, to promote gun safety, such as uh, paying for target ranges or, or state-sponsored hunter safety training in some places. So it's that tax is used to enhance the exercise of the right to arms. The anti-gun lobbies say, well, you know, we, we'd actually prefer, as some people have proposed, 500% or 100% tax. But what we think we can get away with with courts these days might be, let's just have a state parallel to the 11% federal excise tax. Now, one difference is the state of Colorado with its sales tax, is already taxing you. 3.9%. Uh, oh, plus the state and but, local. But, so, like state, but local yeah. additions, it could be up to 10% in certain it, it, exactly. places. So you're already paying up to a 10% tax when you buy any product, including firearms or ammunition in the first place. And then we'd layer 11% more on it. So now you end up with just the local taxes being 20%. And that's to be used uh, not to make the exercise of the right to arms better, safer, you know, more ranges for practice and training, uh, having opportunities for responsible hunting, but to attack the right to arms, to pay for anti-gun propaganda and, and on and on like that. Another bill would say that while people who sell guns have to have a federally licensed uh, 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 permit, an FFL, Federal, Federal Firearms, Firearms License. Yeah. They're saying, well, that's nice. That's terrific. Um, now we should do it on the state level, too, so that they get to pay twice. Yeah. Same sort of thing. Well, right. And it starts with $400 for a one-year license with an unlimited ability for the government, without ever going back to the legislature, to jack up that to as high as it wants. You know, $700 next year, $3,000 in a few years. Which, if I were Cabela's, I'd go, that's not a bad thing. We can swallow it, but the small mom and pop shop, put them out of business. Or Preci the guy who does it over his kitchen table. Precisely. It's to put out of business the guys who are actually the most, <clears throat> the best and the most responsible uh, gun sellers. If, if you buy your firearm from a guy who, you know, he has a, it, it's a part time thing for him. He's, he's got some other job, but he, he sells several dozen firearms a year to people in his gun club, friends of people in his gun club, things like that. That's the guy you want to go to who's really going to be able to give you good advice and say, oh, yeah, I've, I've got a rifle, but now I'm ready to get a handgun. I'm thinking of getting a carry permit. And that guy will take the time to sit down and, and help guide the buyer to, to just the right gun for that particular type of buyer. It's, it's to drive them completely out of business. But the, again, but the you, teenager at Cabela's will be the one to give you that advice. This is just to harass and harangue gun owners and gun dealers. It is hateful legislation. It is, it is pure hate. Right. And these are the same people who go around patting themselves on the back uh, for tolerance, <laughs> which 
is, is just just so false. I mean, they they're tolerant of their political allies but, and really aggressively hostile to everybody else. We should mention this is all happening uh, with the background of a Republican bill that would have made gun crimes uh, more punishable, higher sentences well, gun, for gun, gun crimes, gun theft in particular, gun theft, and that got shot down. Okay, so let's let's say. Uh, yeah, think. I just want to think yeah. about this. So again, they don't want to beat up the bad guys who are stealing guns anymore. They want to beat up the good guys who have been responsible. That that's right, and that got defeated on on party lines early in the legislative session. So if you go steal somebody's, you know, three thousand dollar very high end hunting rifle, that that's a serious offense because it's three thousand dollars worth of property. But if you go steal from a poor person some gun. That might have cost three fifty when they bought it, and now you know it, it, it's a you know it's Ruger, maybe worth two hundred dollars. Ruger Security Nine Nine Millimeter, three hundred and twenty five dollars. Great, reliable self defense weapon. Right, and that's you, you steal a firearm, you steal that firearm. Oh, that's not even a felony. You know, you you can just walk away with that. Probably get out on bail. Get a uh, ticket five minutes later, and and of course that encourages gun theft, because on the black market, one of the best things to sell is a firearm. The black market is the overwhelming supplier of crime guns. So all these people who are performing their supposed identification as gun safety advocates don't want to do anything about the theft of firearms and their sale to criminals. You need to wrap this up, but what should people do? In other words, I've got two questions. What should people do right now? What should they do for their own protection before it becomes illegal? And will the courts save us? Those are three questions, and I'm going to ask you to put the gas on it. Buy firearms and ammunition as you uh, find appropriate for protection of yourself and your family, and get guidance from other more experienced people if you have questions. So it's a good time to stock up. Yes, because um, who, know, who knows what's, what's coming. Um, and there, there are other, you know, just market forces that make it a good time to stock up now rather than later. Uh, second, stay involved and get or get involved. Uh, you can start with a group like the Colorado State Shooting Association, which is the best place to go uh, to get networked with firearms trainers. Maybe you can even go to a, a target shooting competition and, you know, have some fun and, and camaraderie. Uh, and they, but for the immediate threat, yeah. people really need to talk to their legislators. Yes, they do. Particularly swing votes like Dylan Roberts, who sits on the Judiciary Committee and uh, is going to be the, the decider on a lot of these. And besides thinking about the swing votes, maybe you don't live in a swing district, keep on contacting the governor, who is by far the most conservative elected statewide official we have in Colorado. That is the most terrifying thing you've said so far. <laughs> and, well, Governor Polis, you know, we've both known him since the late 1990s. Uh, he's not a hater of gun owners. He, goes, he keeps signing bills to, to criminalize yes, he, us. He goes along with it in a cynical, political way, but he's got no personal animus against gun owners. So the more he hears from people on the civil rights side, uh, the more that might incline him uh, to do the right things sometimes, which he has done, including last session, working behind the scenes uh, to make terrible bills uh, somewhat less bad. Will, will the courts come and save us? Uh, perhaps on some issues, not on, not on everything. What will they not save us on? I think the best chance of getting saved is on the, the way that the, the safe zones for criminals bill, as that was introduced, uh, has a lot of parallels with things that were introduced and, and passed in places like New York and New Jersey, and some of those have been, provisions have been held unconstitutional. Uh, gun conf the assault weapon uh, bans um, are ultimately going to have to be decided by the Supreme Court. When is that going to happen? There's enough of them brewing. There's enough of them, there's enough of them um, conceivably next Supreme Court term or the one after that, if, if the court wants to do it. You know, remember they had, after they decided the McDonald case in, in 2010, it was oh, took him a dozen years to do another major Second Amendment case uh, with Bruin on, on the right to carry. Uh, so it would be nice to say the courts are always going to protect us. You know, on, on a free speech matter, um, you used to be able to have a lot of confidence on something like that. 
Um, on firearms, maybe, maybe not. Get involved. People want to get, get your work. Where do they go? DaveCopel.org, D-A-V-E-K-O-P-E-L.org, and on Twitter, at Dave Copel. At D- Dave Copel. Dave, thanks for everything you do for us. Thank you. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button, too. You don't want to miss a single show.